talk about are kind of how we think about problems, right? So we've, we've dove in deep into a lot of problems and um, why we think about them uniquely, why the solutions are unique, because we're not looking at it at the surface or symptom level, but truly at the root cause. Um, what's missing from all of that is how do you actually do it? What we find when we're working with people clinically is that the biggest gap or failure in, in a process when it comes to healthcare is the habit change. People actually doing stuff. You can give someone the best information. Here's a coolest new widget, you know, some tracking device or an aura ring or whatever it may be. Uh, do they use it? Do they comply with the instructions to the maximum degree that they could derive benefit from it? That's the challenge. Uh, when someone's told something, they agree. That's what they need to do. How do you actually get them to do it? So we have did a lot of work, as some of you already know, with Dr. BJ Fogg, a uh, brilliant man. He runs the Stanford University Behavioral Change Lab. Um, highly impactful when it comes to behavior change. He wrote a book called Tiny Habits, New York Times bestseller on how to adopt and change your habits to become a different version of yourself. And we had to create a version that worked for us. Meaning we're not going to give every patient a book to read. We're also not going to give them a course. We needed to break it down into most impactful pieces of how do you get from where you are to the behavior is permanent. And that came down to six things. And I'm going to break down what those six things are and tell you how we think about behavior change. But before we get into that, uh, I want to just give you some thoughts about the context of behavior change and the mindset. So the first thing is it's not comfortable. Behavior change and habit change specifically. Remember, habits are hardwired. The last time we talked about your thoughts and belief make up who you are they become habits, right? So the things that you think that you believe about yourself become hardwired. And imagine changing something physically about yourself when you have a certain sort of way that you walk or speak and trying to change that, how com uncomfortable that is. It's the same thing with your habits. So they're hardwired and your brain becomes comfortable with them. And when there's a call for a shift, it's not comfortable at all. So understanding, first of all, that this is not supposed to be pleasant, right? It's supposed to be uncomfortable. If it's not uncomfortable, you're probably not doing enough when it comes to shifting behaviors and habits and understand that the outcome, and that's why most people don't do things. You know, it's that like, eh, it's just, it doesn't feel good or it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't want to, or it's uh, too much effort or it's stressful, right? So you can understand enough about your brain from what we've spoken of to deal with the stress in previous episodes, uh, but that uncomfort is something that you will feel. So just understand that that's an innate part of behavior change is discomfort. And if you're not feeling scared, if you're not feeling awkward, you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough. Scary is the right place to be. It has to be a little bit scary. It shouldn't be trauma. Obviously we're not, no, nobody's trying to cause you PTSD, but scary is the place to be. If you can remember that the reward in crossing the line of scary to like behaviors change is so much more rewarding, so much more impactful. And so it's, you're starting from a rough place, but you're ending up so much, uh, somewhere so much better when you get past scary, that achievement level of so much higher. And that leads me to dopamine. So dopamine is obviously the chemical we've spoken of so many times um, that allows you to feel pleasure or reward. And in this case, we're talking about reward, behavior change and feeling good about an outcome. So one thing we've learned from watching patients is that there's this shift that happens in people. We don't, we don't expect first of all, for anyone to change their behaviors like a switch. We expect that when you do something bad, it usually makes you feel good. I eat Doritos every night. I don't. In fact, I used to, by the way, I just reminded myself of that. I don't anymore, but I used to, so I can actually use this as an example. I used to eat Doritos every night. Let's make this real. Uh, it was a bad habit and to take that away from me was not easy because it was a big source of pleasure, which meant not only a craving or a physical habit, but literally a, a shift in dopamine, a shift in that impactful, like crazy amount of flavor that's on each chip that gives you that dopamine hit. And then you need another one and another one, another one. So if you just remove that, flip a switch, 
that's not mentally healthy. And that's why you see the people that are most successful when it comes to behavior change, there's a transition. Why is a transition important? Because if dopamine is a pleasure, or sorry, the chemical that's allowing you to feel the pleasure of the thing that you're doing wrong, which you need to now move away from, well, we already know dopamine also allows you to feel reward. So what we're trying to do with behavior change is shift you from pleasure to reward because you will replace it. We're not telling you to get rid of a habit. That's difficult. I don't eat chips anymore. Wow, that's, you know, that's, that's actually underwhelming and hard to do. What, is, what feels good is the sense of reward you get from the achievement. And if you don't frame it like that to begin with, you won't get it. So that sense of reward of I say no to Doritos feels so good, it's equal to the I ate a Dorito. It's literally that point. So now that's why you see people that are, you know, that are very regimented about their exercise or very specific about what they eat and what they're willing to put on their plate, regardless of who's around them. They're very specific about, no, I don't eat that. And I do eat this. And I, the sense of reward they're getting from the achievement and being consistent is as powerful because it's the exact same chemical as the pleasure they used to get from the thing they did wrong. And just understand that there's a transition that's required of shifting from the pleasure to the reward and understanding this is now the thing that gives me the hit because ultimately that's what you're looking for is the hit. So that's a big one. And if you can start to think about behavior change that way and the reward you'll get from saying no, the great feeling of being able to say no, I just went through the month of Ramadan. It's a month of fasting. So we fast for 30 days. And it's not only a physical cleanse of not eating, but it's also a spiritual cleanse of learning how to say no. Of literally, you cannot eat, you can't even drink water. You can't even look at the wrong thing or hear the wrong thing. It's a complete spiritual, spiritual cleanse. And, uh, you know, after the first three, four days, the, the reward you get from saying no, it's exactly what I'm talking about now, where there's so much pleasure, there's so much satisfaction, I should say, sorry, in saying no, it's as equivalent to what we used to get from the yes that we used to take in, the thing that we're now saying no to. So adopt that, learn that, and make that your reality. Um, this all reminds me of a book. I, I met uh, a lady named Liz Wiseman, uh, sort of brilliant lady. Um, she coaches Silicon Valley type companies on how to get the maximum productivity from their staff. And this isn't about burning people out. This isn't about, you know, pushing people harder and layers of management and meetings at, and hard deadlines. It's more about you're probably able of you're capable of doing a lot more than you think. You're just comfortable where you are. And she has this really cool, uh, you know, visual that she puts out there, which is imagine you're the catalyst for change. You're the person that's trying to change this person. And this is the person you're both holding a rubber band. You hold the rubber band and keep stretching and stretching it until the point where if you pull it anymore, that person is going to fall forward on their face. There's, there's no slack left. That's the point where they've reached their maximum level of discomfort. Eventually, they become comfortable in that role. They've mastered it. They do, a little, they do it sort of intuitively. There's a bit of slack. You can start to pull the elastic band again. And you can start to pull them along with a bit more of a challenge. And then all of a sudden, again, it gets tight and you got to let them rest there. This is the same thing that, that we think of in terms of behavior change that can be done over and over and over and over again. And there's no limit to where you'll end up in terms of the new behavior, right? You can go deeper. You can go from, you know, I don't exercise to I climb Mount Kilimanjaro. It depends how many times are you going to pull yourself along that path of skill development and that elastic, elastic band tightening and pulling you along. Uh, that's up to you. How, once you. Once you get to that comfort level, you're going to know and something or somebody or even yourself has to pull you to the next step. That's human potential. It's limitless. It's truly limitless. You know, you've all probably heard the story of, you know, the one minute mile and it just was impossible. There was a time where that people just couldn't do it. But as soon as one person did it, everybody started doing it because their beliefs allowed them to push themselves to the next level, to develop a new habit, to be able to run just that much faster. You know, this is a phenomenon that speaks to human potential and how we truly don't know what our limits are. And so understand by pulling yourself along uh, that you can keep 
developing more and more and more and never stop unless you choose to for some specific reason. Now, I'll tell you what the six layers of behavior change are. The first thing is identifying what we called your golden habit. And why do we call it this? First of all, what's the outcome? I can't sleep at night. That's the problem you're trying to fix. So the habit isn't go sleep. That's not something that's going to affect change. That's something that's going to lead to a poor outcome. Like I don't know how to sleep. So the habit is turn your laptop off two hours before going to sleep. That's the habit because we know that for some people that don't have a good circadian rhythm, the genes of the internal clock are off for some people. And so they need um, less stimulus at night, specifically blue light, blue light, you know, mirrors daylight and it causes the brain to not produce melatonin. You don't go to sleep. So for some people, the habit they need to do is turn my laptop off. Identifying the golden habit is here's the problem I try to solve. Here's all the potential things that will get me there. What's the easiest thing I can do that's easy to manage, that's a small step, but is the most important in getting me to that outcome? It's not, you know, uh, stop working from home. It's not do not watch Netflix. It's simple. Put an alarm on my phone so that two hours before bed, I turn my laptop off. A simple habit that's super impactful because you now you've given yourself two hours of screen free time. You can still work from home. You can still watch Netflix. You can still do everything, but you've made it easy on yourself. It's a two hour window as opposed to, I just don't do this anymore. That shift, which is more radical and harder to implement. So find those golden habits. What's the problem that I'm trying to fix? What are these things that will get me there? Not the f problem itself, but the things that I can wrap around it, you know, the environmental, the habit type stuff. And how do I pick one or two at a time? You don't want to overwhelm yourself and keep those as my golden habits. The habit is the goal, not the problem itself. The habit of setting the alarm and like clockwork, I close my laptop and I actually find a place to put it away every day. Habit completed. And I learned that for a week or two and I just do that. That's all I do. And then I can add another habit and then I can add another. find those golden habits and implement them. That's one, the easy thing, the thing that I know how to do, the thing that I know is going to have a big impact, the thing that um, is sort of easy to schedule, easy to build a, a you know, regiment around. That's the three or four things you pick and then add them on, add them on, on and do those things. So now that you've identified the habit, you, found, you have your list of golden habits. The next step is what we call habit design. So habit design is around taking this golden habit and providing the structure to make it possible. So what does that mean? It could mean I need to run one kilometer every second day. That could be the habit. Maybe the goal is weight loss. Maybe the goal is better cardiovascular health. Maybe the goal is beating arthritis and getting your body moving. Uh, I need to one, run one kilometer every second day. That's my first golden habit. How do I actually design the habit? so that it happens. I've identified it. Now I need to design it. That might mean scheduling. It literally might mean going into my schedule um, and plugging it in just like when I book a Zoom call so that an alert goes off and it's something that I'm supposed to do. And it's, it's not negotiable. It's in my schedule just like a meeting with a customer is not negotiable. I can't decide at the time of the meeting whether I'm doing it or not. It was booked, it's scheduled, it's happening. Then you look at things like the environment that's required. You know, where do I need to be in order for this habit to happen? If I need to run one kilometer a day and I'm in Toronto in the winter, is that going to happen? Or do I need to make this easy on myself by either finding a gym, by getting a treadmill, by finding a friend that has a treadmill that lives close by? What are you going to do to create the environment so that, the, that the, you're, there's no excuse and there's no inability to adopt the habit? You know, we talked about the laptop as a golden habit. Well, do you actually have a place to store it? Do you actually have a place that's outside of your bedroom where you can put it away safely without the desire to go get it? You know, just a particular cupboard that is designed for laptop storage. That's an example of habit design and wrapping sort of infrastructure around it. It may be something like, you know, visuals. It may be something like reminders. It may be something like putting something on your fridge. 
you know, um, maybe it's organizing the food in your fridge in a way where if I say that, hey, I no longer eat carbs after a certain time. Well, maybe the carbs are stored in the drawer down below and the things that you should be dealing with, like maybe water uh, or a kombucha or something that's good for your gut so you can keep healing at night are front and center in the evening. You know, so make the infrastructure speak to the habit being easy to do because all of what I'm speaking of, and you'll see this repeated theme is how do I make it easy? The other part of habit design is not to expect that your first iteration was perfect. Keep tweaking, you know, go to that level of detail and give yourself that much of respect and self care that you're able to tweak the habit and, and take your own feedback of, Oh, this didn't work. The two hours before bed was just too much. I, I, I bored. And I get frustrated and I can't sleep. So maybe one hour, let's start with one hour, right? It's, it's maybe not the full benefit you needed, but you can tweak the habit so that it sticks. Cause this is one of the key things when you don't stick to the habit and it's part time or temporary, well, then you didn't really achieve much. So tweaking habits is no problem. And, and maybe you take that first week of running your habits and the second week of now giving yourself feedback. Uh, and tweaking them so that they, they stick and they become better. And ultimately, this then becomes your plan. So once you've identified your golden habits, once you've identified habit design, which is all the structure and things you need to do to make sure the habits actually happen, uh, and you've tweaked them, you now have a plan. My plan is I'm going to do this, 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 which is going to lead me to losing 10 pounds. Right? And ultimately, that's where you want to be because then you can stick to it. So the third layer uh, of your sort of behavior change is scaling habits. So once you've got to the point where, you know, the, the goal, the habits are identified, you know what they are, they're working because you've tweaked them. You've created the infrastructure, whether that takes you a day or two weeks, it doesn't matter. J getting it right is what matters and no need to rush when it comes to habit change or behavior change. Um, once you've gone to the point and it's working, it's the right habit at the right velocity and the right scale, um, the right ease of use, the right placement in your home. Now you're ready to scale it. Just like when you scale a business, the machine is working. Now, if I add fuel to the fire, I can do more of the same. So how do you scale a habit? Well, maybe you give that thing more time. Now that I figured out what time to run, where to run, where to put my shoes so I don't make an excuse. There's a gym bag in my car, so I have no excuse. Well, maybe instead of a kilometer, it's two kilometers. You can start to scale the habit because you've now made it your plan and made it a routine. Now make it better. It can be about, like we said, you tweaked and went from one hour, two hours to one hour. Let's bring it back to two hours and let's see how that goes. Let's start to scale that habit. It also means extending the habit beyond the environment you created for it. Okay, I'm doing this thing really well at home. How do I bring it to work with me? How do I change my work environment so that a habit is not just something that I do at home? You know, now that I put my laptop away on time at night and it's been going on consistently for two weeks and I found the right amount of time and it's actually my sleep's gotten better. Well, how do I also now wear blue light filter glasses in the evening at work to even more enhance the ability to eliminate blue light from my life? How do I get a blue light filter on my work screen at work? Cause I now do this and I want my team and my peers to know that I do this. So how do you extend that into your work? How do you extend it into your family's home? You know, when I go to your extended uh, social circles or you go to grandma's house, you know, for Thanksgiving, if you've changed your diet, how do you ensure that it actually extends beyond where you control? Right? So that's what scaling a habit looks like. It's taking it out of the simple, um, call it context that you designed it in, which is really important because that's where you perfect it and the plan gets developed and it, it, it gets curated and bruised and becomes something, but you then need to scale it because it can break when you go to a different environment where the habit doesn't exist. Major, major point of failure for people going to visit family, embarrassed to talk about it. You know, oh, I went to see my mom and I, I can't tell her that I use a red light sauna for my detox. She doesn't even believe that detox is a thing. You know, so that ability to sort of scale it beyond that environment that you've been able to control. Once you're able to do that 
and you've extended and scaled your habits where you know you do more of the same you've extended it uh you maybe even sorry one one note i should add to scaling habits is adding to the habit so making the habit itself bigger what does that mean okay i ran my one kilometer and i'm doing it on time every day i'm going to add some yoga to that maybe every second day i'll do 15 minutes of yoga i stopped eating sugar at night i'm also going to stop eating sugar at, during the day i can do it i now know that i can do it there's 6 hours at home where i don't do it i'm not going to eat it during the day either so adding to the habit you found something that works that sticks it's 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 going well now how do you extend that um and make it um a bigger habit by adding other elements to it modularly attaching other micro habits to the main habit to make it bigger and better and you can do that then we go to what we call challenging habits so this is where on day 1 when you looked at your habit options and you identified here's all the things that will get me there you picked the easy ones the low hanging fruit there were some stuff you ignored cuz it's not the right place to start you don't want to start with something that's going to fall on your face because then you will never get anywhere those challenging habits are the ones where once you've adopted the good uh, golden habits you've modularly grown them you've extended them to other environments like work and family um you're probably ready to start bringing on some of the challenging habits so these are the things like i don't um you know i i turn my laptop off 2 hours before sleep what if i don't use a laptop at home or the phone i want to spend more time with the family it's good for my sleep anyway i'm going to shut my phone off that's hard to do overnight it's not hard to do with time it's not hard to call your boss a few months later and say you know i feel really good about what i'm doing at home i will work like a dog during the day and i'll be highly productive but i can't answer emails after 7 p.m. they're not i mean if the outcome is there and if you're doing what you say most people won't argue with you unless it's an emergency obviously uh but that's a that's a challenging habit to adopt and that's not something you want to do on day 1 but it is something you could do once you've wired your brain for habit change and you got used to being uncomfortable and used to doing things that are scary and used to doing what's not normal for you so finding those challenging habits which probably have bigger impact now the the challenge here again this is a point where people burn out and fail and what you don't ever want to get to the point of is that you've put such a load on yourself that you do get to that burnout that you get that you get to that point where you truly just don't want to do it anymore and then you stop an injury at the gym for example that's a major reason why people stop you know a gym closes and you need to go to a for- location further away that you might stop right so there's many things that can make things more challenging for you uh and then all of a sudden you have to think about how do i p- pair things back a little bit scale it back it's important to have this sort of sustainability check um how do i scale it back so that i'm not pushing myself into burnout i'm at like 85% i'm getting a great outcome but i'm not pushing myself to my max out, out, out capacity where i will fry my brain right uh so those challenging habits of you know i went from eating less carbs to no carbs i you know you go back to your list and if you haven't already identified the challenging habits make bigger versions of the initial habits you know low carb to no carb uh from i'm removing this toxic person from my life to i'm removing toxicity from my life I had such a great impact this one person I know they are the source of my mental health issues but I keep chugging along and accepting it and taking the beating the feeling I get when I remove that well I should remove all toxicity not just an individual but toxicity in general that's a lot more challenging than pinpointing one source so those challenging habits again why do we lay it out this way you don't want to start there right You don't want to you don't you don't go for surgery the day after you start medical school. And I I know not not some of these things aren't as big or as complicated as surgery, but just to give you an anecdote of what it means to train yourself mentally to be prepared for that bigger habit because we know they're uncomfortable like we said, we know that they're scary like we said, uh and we know it isn't intuitive to all, automatically just do it. So, allow yourself to get there slowly. This is also the place like I said for the sustainability check. we then take a step back look at your habits and say what am i overdoing 
which may burn me out and cause us to fail? What am I underdoing that I can, I can scale up a little bit and get more impact out of? So after you've done all this and you get over the hump of some challenging habits, you get into the fifth stage of behavior change, which we call identity change. This is where you go from, hey, I'm trying a new diet to I'm a vegan. It literally is your new identity. You're now at the point where it's not, hey, I've started going to the gym. Oh, I train. I love training. I can't live without training. When you get to that point where a habit becomes permanent, it's an identity change. The identity changes. It's, it's who I am. It's not what I do. I am a vegan. That's what I am. I identify as a vegan, right? Because it's been so many weeks of me sort of indoctrinating myself into this new habit uh, and making it such a priority in my thinking and in my sort of surroundings and scaling and finding the challenging version. It's who I am now. And people know that's who I am now. They've seen it. They've heard it. They smelt it, right? So when you get to that point, we argue that this is the place where behavior change is sort of complete. Now, the process isn't complete. We're going to talk about number six, but you have to, in order to get to this, one important thing that we didn't talk about yet is sort of going beyond um, implementing the tracking. Um, and that's where you can take things. So remember, when it comes to behavior change, unless you've hired a behavior change coach to give you that accountability, one of the most difficult things is your, it's self-governance. It's very hard to self-govern and to get an outcome, right? And to not take that extra snack or to not, not go to the gym that day and to give yourself the break you weren't supposed to have because there's nobody watching you. There's no accountability. Right. And some people will even fake it and they'll say things to their friends like, look what I'm doing, but they don't even do it. So this is where it's important uh, in order to get to this level of identity change. You need to track. So don't rely on yourself, regardless of how you think and feel. Um, create tracking around the habit. If it's something like sleep, you know, if it's something like weight, these things are obvious. A sleep tracking ring or a, a whoop watch, you know, you can track your sleep. If it's something like heart health, you can measure heart rate variability. If it's something like, you know, uh, avoiding toxins, et cetera, you can actually do blood work at then make sure like, Hey, in the month two, I'm going to do blood work to prove that I got better. You know, um, if it's something like putting your laptop away or making sure that you bought the sugar free, uh, stevia flavored candy, as opposed to the sucralose, uh, garbage candy, then it may be note taking. It may be a list, but if you're not having some context in what you're tracking and crossing things off and catching yourself when you forgot or you slipped or you failed and then pushing yourself back into the habit, it's a lot easier to slip and fail. So these are one of the key ingredients to identity change. And you'll see, you can tell who's new at the gym because they're carrying this book with all the exercises and what weight they're supposed to lift and how many reps they're supposed to do. Uh, because they're tracking themselves and that person is there to succeed. That person is like, I'm here for the outcome. I'm not here for entertainment. So I'm going to follow this guide and I'm going to check off everything I did and I'm going to track. And next time when I lifted more weight, I'm going to write it down and I'm going to know how much weight I lifted last time because I wrote it down so that I won't do less. I'll do a little bit more and that, my, that progress starts to happen. Eventually you get to the point where your identity has changed. It's who you are and you don't need the guide anymore, right? Until that day, track. And if there's no tool, conventional tool available for tracking, just do it on right. Do it in writing, do it on paper, create a book, create a checklist and track yourself that allow the tracking to be the accountability tool. Since you don't have the coach, unless you again, go to the extent of helping a coach, wonderful things can happen there as well. So the last phase of what we call true behavior change and where things are truly hardwired and permanent is when you go from activating to what we call advocating. Once your identity has changed, you are now who you are. I am, you know, I am a vegan, like I said, that's, I, and I'm not by the way, but, um, that's maybe who you are. And it's a true identity. It's a label that you go by. And every time you eat, it's your filter that you use, right? It's your new identity. Well, 
if it becomes that impactful, where it's such a big part of your life that it's your identity, what do you see starts to happen? Something we talked about in the last episode, you are like the five people that are closest to you. You could be the person that as opposed to being shifted by them to create the shift, activate to advocate. So you can get to the point where you know this thing so well, it has become such a major part of you that you now extend it beyond yourself into other people around you, your peers, your friends, and how, t- how many times we've seen this when one friend is, you know, uh, low carb, they usually all are. When one friend likes skiing, they all like skiing because your habits extend into your peer group. You do things together. If you could take the best of what you're doing, which is part of your healing journey and becoming the best version of yourself and start to implement and extend that into the people around you, well, then you become the advocate. You become the catalyst, the center of change. You become the source of knowledge and truth. People come to you to seek out information, which drives you to find more information, which again, catalyzes you to even further become that source of truth and knowledge. So this is a huge piece of, you know, what it truly become means to have your behavior changed. When you become the advocate, the group leader, it's permanent because the people around you now rely on you for the habit for the change that I'm, I'm a good sleeper. Sleep is so important to me. I know everything about sleep. I've dove, and dove, dove so deep on sleep that you ask me any question. I know the answer. People will come start asking you the question. They will. You can start to recruit people. This is where you can start to find the people that have the bad habits and you'll see it and you can start to change them. And again, you become that source of truth and source of change. When we talk about the community and what we said earlier about, you know, going to mama's house and scaling your habits, Thanksgiving, you know, how do I explain to my mother that I just can't eat the turkey anymore? I'm not going to eat all that fat or all that carb or all that whatever. What if it's not only you? What if your mother no longer eats it? What if you extend your habits into the community and the good habits that you've learned that have given you the gift of the health that you now have? What if you can extend that into your family and it now shifts their habits? That is becoming an advocate. And that's the epitome of behavior change. So we often end at probably halfway through this. You know, typically people are satisfied with, I've started to scale my habits. They don't get into the challenging stuff. And it's like, I've learned a few things. I made a few tweaks. um, And then they feel like they've done their job because all that we're thinking about is the outcome. If you leave the outcome aside, it's kind of like golfing. You know, if you have the perfect swing, you don't need to look at the hole right? Golfers are, they're looking there. Yes, there's the follow through you're going after, but it's not like the person that can't swing well. And the first thing is he's spinning his head to see where the ball go, right? Uh, Because if your habit is optimal, you know, you're going to get the outcome anyway. You're going to get there. And this is where going beyond the scaling to finding the challenging to truly changing your identity. I am this person now to then becoming the advocate and changing people around you. Uh, that's when it's hard to go back. You're now a different version of yourself. Um, and you now become, like I said, that source of truth, uh, the community leader for this particular top topic or whatever it may be. Um, and think of the energy you're putting out and what you're giving the universe and what you're going to get back when you become the source of change. So one of the things I should tell you about, um, in my personal journey, I found that there's something in habit change that we don't talk about. And it's the reality of the noise that we live in. The noise of everything we're talking about is about disease prevention, disease reversal, longevity, adding 15 healthy years to your life, taking things that are taken for granted as I have them and getting rid of them. Um, And we know that there's a lot of resistance because we're talking about a $4 trillion industry that is broken 90% of that $4 trillion is according to the CDC, the center for disease control is spent on chronic disease. So we're talking about a $3.6 trillion industry not many businesses can say that they operate at that scale that is dependent on people being sick, sicknesses that they didn't need to have in the first place. And so it's very challenging. Once you, once you get to the advocate stage, you start to feel the pressure of the noise. What's the noise? Let me give you an example. Um, you probably heard of Jordan Peterson. 
a uh, Canadian intellect, speaks globally, written a lot of books. Um, his daughter, Michaela, is also an advocate, uh, speaks, has a podcast, brilliant young lady. She did a TEDx talk about the carnivore diet. Why? Because she healed herself through it. She had an autoimmune condition, felt horrible, nothing worked. And when she adopted this carnivore diet, which really meant she eliminated, you know, all the starches, carbs, insulin, spawns, went away, the things that we all already know and talk about, um, she was healed. So she did a TEDx talk about it. TEDx is supposed to be a place for new, dangerous, thought-provoking ideas. They never published her talk. They didn't publish it because it was so against the sort of pressure of pharma to not speak of disease anecdotally. There's no doubt that this was what she changed in her behavior and the outcome was she no longer had an autoimmune condition. In fact, even her family, talk about advocating, her parents also changed their diet because of her, because of how good she felt. They also felt better. Her dad lost a whole bunch of weight and talks about it regularly. There's plenty of anecdotes. Harvard has put out studies about this. Harvard has published studies about how good people feel and how autoimmune conditions and various conditions are reversed through a carnivore diet. TEDx never published her talk. And why do I say this? As you all know, I've done a couple of TEDx talks, talk, sorry, uh, and one of them is published and three minutes of it is missing because I talked about vaccines that are used on children and how not the vaccine itself, but some heavy metals can cause certain kids with certain genetic profiles to get neural inflammation, which leads to something that looks like autism. They cut that part out. So why is this all so important? Because as you do what you do, there will always be the naysayers. This is one of the biggest challenges because nobody wants to see everyone, anyone do better than themselves. And most people are willing to bring you down instead of the bringing themselves up to make themselves feel better. And you're also struggling with an industry that doesn't want to hear about your success. There's a constant battle of this industry that creates $3.6 trillion in revenue on the promise of you being sick. And if you're not sick, what happens to that revenue? So, you know, you look at things like how, how often can you look on the news and find out anything about the carnivore diet? But veganism is everywhere plant-based, how good it is for the environment, how good it is for people, how good it is. Then you start to understand who is building the plant-based foods and who is supporting uh, the various voices that we hear that talk about things in certain ways. And then you wonder why we hear a message one way or the other. So I say this not as a conspiracy, <laughs> but I say this in the reality of the journey I went through and the journey that Michaela Peterson went through and her dad went through, that if you are going to become an advocate for change and if you're going to truly find that source of truth that allows you to become healed, it allows you to heal others anecdotally. We're not out here to prove to doctors what we do is right. And so we don't need clinical evidence. We just need to be healthy. Be prepared for the real challenge, the noise the noise that you're going to compete with, that your friends hear, that your family hears, that where they're going to tell you you're wrong, where they're going to tell you that's not the way it is, where they're going to tell you this doesn't work, where they're going to pull up studies from doctors that show you that this is actually going to make you sick. We're going to say, here's the better way. Because we've seen, especially in the last two years, all that noise and the voices that power them versus other voices that are you know, coming through other channels, how biased they are. Very clear bias. If you, if you step back openly and look at them, and I'm of the mind where I used to listen to certain voices religiously and believe them, who I now believe don't really understand what they're talking about. Because I've seen the bias. And a lot of times it's not their own fault because they're so deep into what's being told to them that they don't realize it's not even fully accurate. And so this is a big part that is not taught in behavioral change science, but it's just 
the practical reality of what you're going to have to deal with myself having just gone through it people like Michaela having just gone through it you're going to have to fight the noise and once you get past the noise you become a champion that everyone follows and pursues and we talked about this earlier that ivory tower where information is kept and that it's meant to be the conduit to knowledge and you look at a guy like Dave Asprey who has written you know uh has written several books about health, has helped people lose literally millions of pounds of weight. Um, the early challenges, are you a doctor? No. Is this evidence-based? No. But now that he's broken through a certain threshold where his voice has a certain volume, those same people that used to criticize him now pay $4,000 to attend his conference. I've been there and there's a lot of doctors there, right? Because they, they now have the credibility of somebody who's been published in a book and speaks on TV and they're buying the credibility as opposed to buying the content itself. So if I leave you with anything, it's that. It's that it's one thing to identify the habits. It's one thing to understand, you know, the neurochemical wiring that will drive you towards reward. It's one thing to get past scary and discomfort and start to do things um, that are perhaps uh, awkward. Uh, it's one thing to pull that rubber band and keep stretching yourself along and every time you find a place of comfort to find another level to get to because you can. It's another thing to get through these six layers of habit change and come out the other end of an advocate. But once you are that advocate, get prepared to fight the noise because everyone around you is going to provide it to you um, and the work that you do to help other people, this will be your biggest challenge. And I wish you the best of success follow this. And just like myself, you'll find that you're going to come out the other end, a different version of yourself. And so will the people around you.